We are we living in a computer program reality, and the only clue we have to it is when some variable is changed and some alteration in our reality occurs. We would have the overwhelming impression that we were reliving the present deja vu, perhaps in precisely the same way, hearing the same words, saying the same words. I submit that these impressions are valid and significant, and I will even say this, such an impression is a clue that at some past time point, a variable was changed, reprogrammed as it were, and that because of this, an alternative world branched off. Welcome to the Friday edition of Free Association Radio. This is the Friday Forecast. I am your host, Robert Phoenix. And it is gray and cold and damp here in the East Bay. The air of morning has settled across the land as my Oakland days went down unceremoniously to the Detroit Tigers, six to nothing last night. Their magical season coming to an abrupt halt. And I think the most ironic part or this most, the, the most surreal part of the whole thing for me was being at a place called Bobby G's in uh, Berkeley on University Avenue. The, it, it, Bobby G's has amazing pizza, gluten-free pizza. All, all, the food is terrific. If you like beer or, in, or beer aficionado, maybe the best halves in town. Uh, sight lines, not so great, but it was a strange vibe last night. You had, you know, essentially three three games going on. You had the A's playing, the Yankees were playing the Orioles, and Yankee fans are everywhere, and they were there last night. There was a football game going on, and then there was the debates. And unfortunately, um, we had to suffer through the debates for about an hour, almost an hour and a half until – that got cleared up, and then we could focus on the game. And it was it was kind of a bizarre vibe. I mean, you had about 80% of the people, maybe even more, in in uh, Bobby G just wanting to watch the game. And yet we're sitting there being force-fed, Joe Biden and Paul Ryan. Uh, and then what was really interesting was that uh, because the sight lines are so tight in there and they packed everybody in, was that uh, there were these two guys trying to watch the Yankee game. And, Got in, the, got in the way of this older guy with his wife watching the debates. And it got ugly. And the older guy, like, kicked these guys. And the fight almost broke out. And I knew at that point it was going to be a kind of a bad night for the A's. But their season, and here's where I get to <clears throat> work where we're headed in with all this. Their season was a labyrinth. It was a labyrinthian experience, you know. It started on the outside, spring training, and then they entered into the season itself. And it was winding. It was circuitous. Uh, it, it was it was amazing. And we didn't know where it was going to end up. And it ended up very, very close to the center. They wound up winning the playoffs uh, or playoff, a play-in game almost against the, uh, the Texas Rangers. And there was so much drama, excitement, and last minute, last second clutch wins that it was a breathtaking and a really wonderful, wonderful uh, time to be an A's and an East Bay sports fan. The A's brought the East Bay together in a way that I hadn't seen in quite some time. But it came to an end, and now a new labyrinth and a new journey begins. 
Uh, today, we were supposed to have Claire Kuhn on uh, later in the show to talk about free energy. And unfortunately, she is sick and will not be able to join us uh, on today's program. But we are absolutely and utterly blessed to have three amazing musicians that are all working together uh, on this whole idea and concept and theme of the labyrinth uh, and the musical equivalent uh, or, or the equivalence of, of the labyrinth and the mystery of the labyrinth. And music is, is a very labyrinthian experience. It takes you in, it takes you on a journey, and, and you lose yourself as part of the process. So this is a very exciting cross-pollination of a lot of different styles and and uh, idioms. It's a it's a it's a true world fusion, and I think music is a really amazing place for uh, this kind of synthesis to occur. I think it's one of the it's one of the best areas where cross pollination, music and food, where cross cultural cross pollination can take place. So let me bring on right now. I'm not sure who's calling here or uh, at what at what number they're going to be on, but there are three five or no numbers. But we're going to have Kyla Flexer, Ross Daly, and Kelly Tama, and we're going to talk about their project and uh, hopefully play a little bit of music here and try to make some some cross-cultural touch points so that everybody can get into this and understand the meaning of the labyrinth in their own lives. Because culturally and politically, it feels like we're deep in a labyrinth right now. And I'm not sure any of us really knows at this point where it's all headed. So maybe we could have a soundtrack to that and get us through some very uh, interesting, circuitous, perhaps perilous times. All right, let's uh, let's try this number. Culturally and politically. Hello there. Hey. Hi, is this Kelly? Hello. Uh, good morning. I want to know, since you're in the East Bay, by the way, I'm a big uh, Bobby G fan too. Okay. Um, have you noticed, and I'd be really perplexed if you haven't, the extraordinary amount of air activity here? I'm in Berkeley. Yeah. Do you have any information? Air activity? You mean like helicopters and such? In constant aircraft. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, I've been... No I've actually noticed that for the last three years, to be honest with you, and it's really well. Pick- have you not noticed an escalation in the last several days? Well, okay, I'll keep my eye on it, but I know that for a fact that they've been priming people in in Albany uh, with the number of helicopters that have been flying over, and they they said that they were taking these kind of ambient radiation readings, ground radiation. Mm, yeah, I'm not, you know, I'm not sure about that, and yeah, I'm sure it's not. <laughs> yeah. I'll, I'll, you know, I, I, my my inner knowing tells me there's something up. I was just wondering if you had any inside scoop. That's well, about it. I don't want to take your time. Up. Again, this goes back to at least three to four years uh, when I was living in Albany. Then I moved out to Point Richmond. Was the amount of helicopter surveillance? Yeah, was uh, quite noticeable. And I remember at one point I used to live on Curtis Street in Albany. There was a helicopter that was about 250, maybe 300 feet in the air, doing figure eights. Uh, down the block for about 10 minutes. I had no idea what was going on with that helicopter. And that's not the first time I had seen that. It wasn't, certainly wasn't the last time. But mm. I'll, I'll check it out. I'll, I'll keep my eyes open. Thanks, thanks. I, yeah. So, well, thank you for calling in. I know you have your tentacles out there. <laughs> I do. I appreciate it. Great to okay. talk to you and love your show, love your work. Thank you so much, Robert. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, well, let's find out if this is, uh, let's see, maybe Ross and Kelly. Hello there. Hello, yes. Uh, Hi, is this Ross? Uh, this is Ross Davy. Yeah, that's correct, yes, yes. Hi, Ross. How are you? Very well, yourself. How are you doing? Uh, I'm great. Let's see if we can find Kyla here. Hello, Kyla? Hello, how are you? I'm great. How are you doing? You're on the Good, very well. Ross. Yeah, we're all together now. Perfect. Great, 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 great. So I want to thank both of you for uh, coming on the show and uh, being able to talk about your project. Uh, let me just give a little bit of background to some of the listeners who may or may not be familiar with uh, your work individually. Uh, Ross is legendary, and, and he has become – and, Ross, I, I'm, I'm sure you're quite humble around your accomplishments, but 
um, he's, he has literally become synonymous with Greek music, even though he himself is not Greek. He was born in uh, Kings, Lynn, uh, Kings Lynn, Norfolk, and yet he has become the equivalent of a modern master on, on the uh, Cretan lyre and uh, has a number of recordings, some of which are more traditional than others, some of which branch out into kind of more fusion and uh, ambient based, but a, 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 a very interesting odyssey uh, winding up on the island of Crete and becoming really a, a, a master of the, of the lyre. And, uh, and Kyla plays violin and uh, has been involved with a, a number of projects. Uh, and she basically takes uh, klezmer music in a, in, in a variety of styles and fuses them together in a very unique way. Third Ear is one of her projects. She also has a connection to Kitka, the wonderful female vocal ensemble here that's based in the East Bay. And so they've come together for this musical project along with Kelly Tama. Kyla's group is called Heslin. And um, I, I just wanted to sort of say hello and welcome both of you. And, and, and I, I guess I could ask you kind of one at a time so I can play traffic cop here. Uh, what brought you together with this project? And why is the, this notion and the meaning of the labyrinth uh, so important in terms of uh, almost a, like a portal for what you're doing here? Ross, why don't we start with you and, and, and figure out how you actually made it to this part of the journey with these folks? Okay, very well. Well, so maybe I should start with the, the labyrinth. Um, well, the labyrinth for us, because, you know, uh, myself and Kelly Thomas, we live on the island of Crete which is where the original labyrinth was. Uh, the, for those of you who perhaps don't know Greek mythology that well, the labyrinth was uh, under the palace of Knossos in the, uh, the, the center of the island of Crete, and it was created by uh, Vedalus, and uh, he and his son Icarus trying to ex escape from it. Uh, that's when the whole thing of Icarus falling down uh, because of his wax-made wings. But anyway, the labyrinth, it's, it's a, a lot of twists and turns and unexpected things. And it's actually a symbol of life itself. Uh, and the uh, the Minotaur, who is the the legendary sort of rather ugly beast who would devour people who went into the labyrinth, is a symbol of our ego, basically. Mm -hmm. And then the uh, Theseus, who was the person who managed to escape from the labyrinth, did so using a thread given to him by the goddess Ariadne. And the thread is actually the symbol. Uh, Ariadne's thread is the symbol of knowledge. So knowledge is the way to get out of the labyrinth and to way, the way to escape from the beast of the Minotaur who's always ready to devour us. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that's the symbolism of the labyrinth. Wonderful. Amazing um, symbolism, yep. And uh, but I myself, I've been living on Crete for the last 37 years. And uh, that's my sort of base, uh, so to speak. And we <clears throat> involve ourselves with the study of various modal musical traditions of the Middle East, Central Asia, Transcaucasia and even India and uh, so in the course of all of this process uh, of, you know, of working with these particular types of music uh, it was quite a natural occurrence to meet up with uh, Gary uh, Hegedus and also with uh, Kyla Flexer with whom we'll be working in the next few days and Miles J another musician also from here from the United States uh, and uh, so I met up with them during the course of all of this activity, and uh, we decided to start a collaboration, which is what we're doing now. Wonderful. And so were you here already in the States, or did this happen sort of no, transiently? No, no. Um, uh, well, well uh, yeah. uh, Kyla will explain that to you. Yes, uh, oh, well, I was just going to say that the, 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 the way uh, we um, – sort of came together was that uh, Gary Hegedus and I have been just absolutely huge fans of Ross, Ross's music and of Ross and Kelly's playing and compositions. And um, G Gary has uh, been a fan for probably 30 years, and I was just introduced to Ross's music maybe five or six years ago. And um, we really consider Ross our teacher, even though uh, we haven't formally studied. We, we have studied his music and his CDs and transcribed and um, gotten tremendous inspiration from uh, 
not only his playing and um, compositions themselves, but his approach to music, which um, has so much integrity and so much grounding in traditional music, and yet he is uh, such a pioneer in terms of composition and his um, great desire to 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 educate. He has an amazing school on Crete called Labyrinth, and he conducts seminars uh, inviting the the most incredible array of people, um, singers and instrumentalists. And um, uh, Ross, you can you can tell them about Labyrinth. But uh, anyway, so we went. We we wrote a series of grants to to start this project, and we're lucky enough to be funded, and lucky enough that Ross and Kelly agreed to. Uh, to this collaboration, and so several years ago we went to Crete to uh, to play with them, which was an absolutely fantastic uh, opportunity for us, and uh, we're just thrilled that they're that they're here and this is actually happening. So, um, so that's uh, that's sort of the history of the of the project. So R- Ross, in, uh, in your mystery school, so to speak, uh, on Crete, do people? that attend that, do they have to be musicians or can non-musicians be a part of that and have an experience of the mystery of the labyrinth and maybe get a little musical at the same time? Well, actually, yes. <clears throat> Let me give you a sort of a, a bit of a context of it. Uh, our school is situated in a village of, which is, has a population of 800 people, so it's a very, very small village. Um, so during the, the time, especially in the, the summer months of July and August, when we have most of our seminars and master classes in progress, there's a lot of people there, the musicians and various people who, who love music. Actual participation in the seminars and workshops themselves is more advantageous for somebody who is already a musician because you're able to take in a large amount of information. Mm-hmm. Having said that, however, we have never said to somebody, you come, you don't come, or things like that. But we don't make any restrictions. Mm-hmm. But we do tell people that you know, if, if you're not very experienced, you may, there may be somewhat of a limit to the amount of information you can take in. However, we do um, encourage people to come, even just as listeners or as people, you know, as observers of the workshops, if they're unable to participate you know, sort of in a more practical way. So it is open to everybody, yes. Uh-huh. And I will say also, Robert, that um, uh, we have an event coming up um, on Monday, the 15th, uh, for all folks who are interested in this music, musicians and non-musicians alike. It's a lecture demonstration dialogue with Mm -hmm. Ross and Kelly um, at Musically Minded Academy, which is in Oakland. Mm -hmm. And um, we're very excited about that. That's at 7.30 this this coming Monday, and mm-hmm. Ross and Kelly will be playing, demonstrating their amazing instruments, uh, the, the lyra, um, and talking about music, answering questions, and it, it'll be a fantastic opportunity to uh, to really interact with them and ask ask them what, what what's on their mind. Mm-hmm. Um, so we have that on Monday. What other dates do you have? that you guys will be uh, performing and, and doing uh, workshops with people. Yes. Now, is your radio show, uh, is this a, an East Bay listenership or the this area? Is, this is global. I mean, oh, we wonderful. Have somebody, yeah, we just had somebody call in from the East Bay because they follow the show, but people uh-huh. all over the world listen to the show. Okay. Well, there are many dates, and um, I I, I can say that uh, I'll, I'll give you the first few, and then I'll direct you to a website where you can see the, the whole story. Okay. Um, the first date is Sunday, October 14th, which is this, this coming weekend. We'll be in San Francisco at a venue called Vera Cocha, um, and you can uh, go to my website to find out how to get tickets for that, and that would be um, kylaflexer.com and then you can go to the Labyrinth Tesleem page and mm-hmm. that will give you all the information you need for that show. Uh, I mentioned the lecture demonstration dialogue on the 15th, which is mm-hmm. in Oakland, and um, you can buy tickets for that on brownpapertickets.com mm-hmm. and also the information is on the same page. Uh, then we'll be down in Riverside, California at the University at the Culver Center. 
Mm -hmm. um, in Santa Barbara the next night, and that will be a double bill with Kitka, who you mentioned earlier. Mm -hmm. um, they're they're doing an all Greek repertoire program, and then um, the Labyrinth Teslim collaboration with uh, Ross and Kelly, Gary and myself, and uh, bassist Miles J will be on that that show as well. Uh, then we're doing a show in a little town called Fraser Park. And uh, on the 26th, we'll be back up here in Santa Cruz, double billing with Kitka. October 27th, we'll be in Oakland um, at the First Unitarian Church. And that's, uh, as well, a double bill with Kitka. Mm -hmm. um, and then our last um, concert will be in Davis, just the quintet again, Labyrinth, and Teslim, and Miles J. Oh, wonderful. Uh, great. So what I'll do also is I'll put your link on the show page here, and anybody that wants to find out more will have that link. Perfect. This, this, of course, will be archived and podcast, and there's a lot of people that listen to the show in the podcast form. Uh, what, I think what I'd like to do is maybe play a little music, and I did not – I was not able, uh, Kyla, to uh, download your track so what I did do, though, is I did go to the Rock, Paper, Scissors page. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to try to play this. It's not ideal. I'm going to play it through the speakers. Uh, people can get a sense of it. I, what I'm going to play now is, uh, and I have not uh, I have not heard the track because I just fired up the page. Maybe you could tell me um, and, uh, and the audience a little bit about it. It is... Uh, Let's see, God, my, I'm going blind in my old age. <laughs> Petaluda, this is from Tesla. Uh, that's, uh, that's from the Teslim record. Yes, now I, I, I just emailed you some MP3s. Did those come through? No, one did not. And it's unfortunately, because we're up against the, the time, it would take me a while to uh, no upload, upload. So why don't we just try this? It's, it's worked in the past, and, and the audio uh -huh. is, is acceptable. Wonderful. Uh, why don't we try this? What can you tell us about this track? Uh, this is a song that Gary Hegedus wrote, and uh, Gary's a wonderful oud player, saws player, uh, plays uh, many, many stringed instruments, and um, uh, I, I can safely say that this was definitely inspired by, by Ross's music, so um, we recorded this a few years ago. So. Okay, here we go. This is uh, uh, Petaluda from Taslim. And uh, we'll be back after we have this brief musical interlude. We'll talk more with Ross and Kyla, and we'll play one of Ross's tracks after this one. And uh, into the labyrinth we go. Okay. Thank you. 
Actually, um, a track called El Meod Naala. Ah, oh, is... I'm sorry. I, I'm no, all... no problem. My apologies. <laughs> no problem. It's a, that's a traditional. The, the melody, the basic melody, is a traditional Sephardic uh-huh. song, and then Gary and I arranged the sort of arabesque fiddle lines and um, had our friends 
Cher Kamen and Julian Smedley uh, play play in the in the little orchestra. Mm-hmm. Uh, that would that would definitely have made uh, Hamza Al Din smile a little bit. <laughs> On the you know this whole notion of, of fusion and synthesis and music to me has always been a, a one of my uh, passions in terms of my listening and in writing. My good friend Stephen Kent just got back from touring with uh, Carlos Nakai and uh, some singers from Mongolia, and uh, it, it, I don't think it ever really gets tired because the combinations. Are really seem to be endless. Ross, can you can you speak to to that quality of bringing all these various traditions together and and the and the types of music that come out of this really unique kind of evolving uh, DNA? Okay. Uh, well, um, apart from the purely human aspect, which is that music is a, is a human activity and therefore brings all human beings together. But even on a rather more specific level, there are certain musical traditions which extend from northwest Africa to western China and just about everywhere in between, which are musical uh, idioms known as modal music. And within this enormous family of musics, uh, there are many, many crossovers of influence and uh, the, the peoples who lived in this vast geographical area had in the past a lot of contact, the one with the others. And so there was a lot of exchange and give and take of information and uh, ideas and things. So that does actually mean that all of the musical idioms within this vast geographical area are, in fact, interconnected on a historical level. Mm-hmm. So right. uh, th- that <clears throat> that means that there is immediately a lot of uh, room for you know, meeting and experimentation and uh, collaboration. Mm-hmm. They have a lot of common elements already there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. There's like a mother tongue, so to speak. Uh, in a way, it's sort of a distant mother tongue, which has branched out into various other uh, other languages and uh, things like that, which in a musical sense. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like and saying that you know, sort of people who speak uh, Italian and who speak uh, Spanish and who speak French would have con- common elements coming out of a Latin language, which is older. Mm-hmm. It's, it's something rather similar in a way, in, in mm-hmm. a musical sense. Uh, some people uh, in musical circles um, don't really take, in critical musical circles, don't yes. really take kindly to the term <clears throat> fusion uh, or, yes. or or hybridization. And, 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 and to their point, it can be done in a way which feels like it's, um, uh, I don't know, maybe maybe a Disneyfication of music, you know, exactly, and, exactly, yes. and, yeah, and 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 the traditions aren't really being honored, but when they do, um, it's actually quite exciting. I, I wanted to ask uh, the two of you kind of about your own personal relationship to music and kind of how how you got to where you are, because I mean, in a way, that's kind of a labyrinth as well. Ross, when you were young and playing playing in the you know the fields or the streets or wherever it was in the in the in the UK where you grew up. Did you ever have any inkling that you would wind up on Crete, you know, as a kind of a, a, a master lyra player and, you know, for lack of a better term, running a mystery school? I mean, this is actually a really interesting journey that you're on. Well, when I was much younger, I very, very rarely ever had any idea as to where I'd be uh, for anything more than 10 days ahead. <laughs> <laughs> not very, not very clear idea. And uh, that was something which is in my whole approach to music and to life, actually, uh, was a rather a key element, was that you know, it was quite often embarrassing sometimes that people would often sort of rather scornfully ask me in those days, well, here you are studying all these strange, obscure instruments and things. Where is this going to take you? What job are you going to do? You know? <laughs> and my answer was, I don't know. <laughs> but uh, so I consider that if I do have one positive attribute to my being, I would say that it's the ability to trust my fate. <laughs> and that's mm. about it. <laughs> uh-huh. <laughs> uh. What about you, Kyla? Uh, well, I, I started out very, uh, very uh, typically uh, in 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 school back then. They they had uh, every 
everybody got to pick an instrument, and I chose the violin, and uh, I, I played classical music all the way through uh, through high school, and then in college I um, I began to uh, play some Irish music and some klezmer music, and um, eventually found my way to um, to Ross's repertoire and. Uh, so I, I I feel like I'm I will always be I think every musician feels that they'll be uh, eternally a student but I'm uh, I'm studying uh, Turkish music and some Greek music and uh, r- 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 I'm less interested in a specific genre than in uh, tunes I have to say so. I I will find a, a a song that I love and I will learn it and and study as much about uh, a, a, about those uh, the origins of that song and um, and now we have the technology to 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 slow music down and really t- tear it apart and study it and um, so uh, yeah that's sort of how I got I got here. We just lost a. A, a wonderful member of the Bay Area world music scene, and Jeffrey Gordon, a few weeks. Oh, you, I, I you, had not heard about that. Did you, you didn't know that? Yeah, Jeffrey. No. Jeffrey passed away. Uh, I think it's about three weeks ago now. Oh my gosh. Yeah, it was right over. Uh, in fact, no, it's a little bit longer. It was right after uh, the Labor Day uh, uh, weekend, and he hmm. he suffered a heart attack in. Oh, uh, wow. In uh, in I believe it was uh, New Mexico driving. Oh, wow. Yeah, wow. so. Anyway. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, why don't we do this? Why don't we play a track from uh, Ross uh, Nagma? Ross, do you want to tell us anything about this piece? Uh, yes. Uh, which piece is it exactly? Uh, Nagma. Nagma. I see. Uh, Nagma is actually the title of uh, of a re- of a record, which uh, I did together with um, uh, with some uh, musicians, uh, Paul Grant, and with. Uh, Nayan Ghosh from India, and with Bijan Shamirani. So I would imagine it, it, there is a title called the Nagma Kabuli, which is a, a piece which is from Kabul in Afghanistan. Mm-hmm. So I would imagine it's that piece. Uh, so if, if that's the case, then it's a piece which is composed by a very great uh, Afghan Rabab player who died in the 1970s. His name was Ustad Muhammad Omar, and he was my teacher for Rabab. Uh, and so it's one of his compositions. Uh, Dedicated to his hometown of Kabul. Mm. Okay. All right, this is Nagma. If, if, if that's the piece, if that's the one, yes. Sir. Okay, here we go. Uh, Ross yes. Daly, uh, Nagma, if that's the piece. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Thank you. 
Is that right, Ross? That was indeed correct. Yes, yes. Oh, wonderful. I love, was that a, was that a tabla or doombeck that came in in the middle? Uh, of the it was two drums actually. There was a tabla played by Pandit Nayan Ghosh from India, mm-hmm. and a tombak or zarb, which is a traditional drum from Iran, played by Bijan Shimirani. Wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Uh, one you. of the things that people may not uh, understand about you, Ross, is that you're not just somebody who's camping out uh, in Crete, you are deeply woven into the uh, musical and cultural context of Greece. And in fact, you were the musical director for the Olympics uh, uh, and the Olympic activity there on Crete when the Olympics Uh were in Greece. Well, what was that like for you to be picked for that? And how did you feel uh, about that? Well, it was quite an honor, of course. Uh, uh, I was put in charge of the, the cultural events for the city of Heraklion on Crete for the, the 2004 Olympic Games, which were held in Greece. So I had the opportunity to invite uh, over 300 musicians from all over the world, uh, from traditional musical uh, 
idioms and uh, to put them all together in a, a series of 15 concerts, which were <clears throat> was, was quite a, a rather large undertaking, but extremely rewarding in many ways and uh, a very exciting experience to have all those musicians all there together and interacting with one another. Um, there was quite a lot of preparation necessary for that to get people to sort of prepare things uh, in collaboration with one another. Mm-hmm. And uh, this was all, of course, put on free for the public. There was no charge for anyone. Right. And uh, so there was quite a lot of participation of the people themselves of the island of Crete in these uh, these concerts. Many, many people came to them and enjoyed them. And there were many things arranged actually on the streets of the city of Iraklio so that um, the event would actually find the people rather than the people having to find the event. And uh, uh, so it was a very, very exciting time for us. We're, we're living in a, uh, challenging times as well as uh, exciting times, and the challenge comes mostly in the form of uh, economies uh, around the world and going through some point, yeah. very serious times. And you're very close to that uh, in Greece. Can you uh, share with some of us uh, who have seen uh, the protests and some of the uh, riots and uh, against the uh, the enforced uh, enforced austerity? Can you give us a sense as to what that's like and what the mood is uh, currently? Well, at the, the present time, things are very, very serious, actually, in Greece. And, uh, you know, when you push a person with his back up against the wall and put a knife to his throat, he's going to react in a rather violent way. Mm-hmm. And that's the only thing you can really expect of him. So that's exactly what's, being, what's happening at the present time. The Greek people are being pressed and pushed and pushed down to such a degree that uh, they just cannot tolerate it. And... Uh, it's not just a psychological issue. It's it's a uh, you know that they cannot live. Yeah. So they're starting to react in a rather rather violent way, in some cases, and in a rather extreme way, which is only to be expected. The bad thing, however, is is that uh, revolutions of, the, of a nature uh, of a sort of a violent nature with sort of upheavals and that sort of stuff, very rarely, if ever, produce the desired results. That's right. So that's why I think it's uh, it's very, very imperative that people, and especially the people who are in charge of the situation, take a good account of it and start to think of some real solutions for the problem before uh, situations arise which will be beyond anyone's control and certainly not to anyone's liking. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that's why I think that it's very, very serious that solutions are found quickly. And they have to be real solutions. I mean, we can't all just be propping up a banking system and that sort of stuff and, and false economies, which are based on on thin air, really. Um, yeah. You know, people are being the, the people are being expected to pay for all of this, and uh, to keep a, a small cabal of people in an extremely luxurious lifestyle, well, everyone else just sort of suffers miserably. And right. I think that's extremely unfair to the ordinary man. I I completely and utterly. Agree with you. Kyla, on your end, here in the United States, you've been a working musician for a number of years, and uh, I think you've probably seen uh, green times, and, and I don't know, are you seeing, seeing lean times now? Uh, yes. I mean, it, it, it's uh, it's very difficult to make a living as a musician anywhere, um, and um, for, for a number of reasons, I... I uh, have chosen to to teach um, here and and not have to tour, and um, and I, I I love I love my work and I feel very very lucky to have um, such wonderful students um, here in the Bay Area. Um, so uh, so you know I, I I think one has to. I know very few musicians who can only perform, mm-hmm. um, and. Uh, it's it's tricky. You have to do all kinds of other things. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, well, listen, I have really enjoyed speaking with the two of you and finding out more about uh, your project, and we're going to have the link up uh, on, the, uh, on the show page. Now, if people have enjoyed listening to your music, where can they go to, to, to purchase it, download it, individual websites, iTunes? Where do you, where do you want them to go? Ross, why don't you tell them about your your download site? Oh, yeah, uh, my own website, which is www.rossdaily, which is R O S S D A L Y, 
rossdavy.gr is the first two letters of Greece. Um, you can get all of my music from there. It's quite easy. And Ross has 35 uh, recorded albums, according to Wikipedia, by the way. <laughs> If Wikipedia says so, it must be true. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I'll tell you, they're all good. So, uh, Kyla, what about so you? Go download them all. Where, Pardon? Where, where can people find your music? Uh, let's see, CD Baby and uh, Amazon and iTunes, those okay. kinds of places. And are you are you two going to be recording your performances uh, over the course of the next few weeks? Yes, we hope to record um, b- both the performances, and then we we hope to go into the studio and and um, also record. Excellent. All yeah. right. Well, uh, thank you for coming on the show, especially at short notice. And um, thank you so thank much. You very much. Yeah, thank you. And, and in challenging times, in the in the labyrinth of the human experience, which it seems like where we're at, music really is uh, the soundtrack to going home. That's my that's my feeling. And I want to thank you both for continuing your your own personal journey in music for the rest of us. Thank you, Robert. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Take good care. Okay. You too. You as well. Bye-bye. All right. So that was Kyla Flexer and Ross Daly from the Labyrinth Project, and uh, really thrilled to have them on. I'm going to play another uh, piece. Uh, This would be from uh, Kelly Toma, who is Ross's uh, partner and collaborator. I'll play that a little bit later. Maybe I'll play it at the end of today's show okay in fact what i'm going to do now is why don't i play another piece of music let me play a little bit of jorge reyes uh one of my uh favorite musicians and uh a musical synthesis but really kind of rooted in a very different part of the world the mesoamerican uh tradition of music so this is jorge reyes el sendero the late, great Jorge Reyes, uh, who uh, passed away uh, three years ago now. A dear friend and an inspiration to me, especially during the 1990s. I'll be back in three minutes, 44 seconds, 7 one 8 I see you. You're hanging there. You called in. I think you want to talk. We'll chat with you uh, after this brief musical interlude. Again, Jorge Reyes, El Sendero. <laughs>
That was Jorge Reyes, El Sendero, bringing us to the second hour of today's show. Minus Claire Kuhn. She'll be on next week. Fingers crossed. All right. Uh, let's go to the uh, uh, this caller calling us from the 718 area code. Hello, you're on the air. Hello? Hello? Okay, I'm just listening. All right, back into the mute queue you go. All right, so let's uh, let's transition here, and I'm going to talk a little bit, or I'm going to address a little bit about the uh, the debate last night. Big shout out to Pam Ella Nudges and Truth Nova in the chat room. What's happening, guys? Um, so I watched the debates. Where do I start? Uh, First of all, we have to understand that the notion of the issues is completely illusory. So they're debating about issues that are illusory. They're, some of the language that was used was, for me, troubling. And some of the scenarios that they were painting was, was disturbing. First of all, what they did in the debate is that both vice presidential candidates agreed upon The fact that Iran is the head of state-sponsored terrorism. Do you see how the target moves? You know, first it was Afghanistan. Right after 9-11 happened, it was Afghanistan. We got to go to Afghanistan. That's where where Osama bin Laden is. That's where the Taliban is. These are the guys that did it. We're going in there. And then all of a sudden, it's like, well, where are they getting their money? Where are they getting their funding? Well, they're getting it from... That guy over there, Saddam Hussein, and what is Saddam Hussein going to do? Well, Saddam Hussein is creating nuclear weapons, rods, yellow cake from Niger. This is the dialogue, right? And all of a sudden, you know, he's going to be a threat in the region. If he's a threat in the region, he's a threat to, you know, our friend Israel and the rest of the world. So now, now we begin to see that Saddam Hussein was responsible for 9-11, indirectly responsible for 9-11, that justifies the invasion of Iraq and the taking over of Iraq's natural resources. Iraq is no longer a sovereign nation. It is under the control of the IMF and the World Bank, the United States, and Israel. In fact, most of most of uh, Iraq's petroleum, and Iraq has the second largest amount of petroleum in the Middle East. Don't let anybody shit you. It does. It's huge. The other reason why we went into Iraq, obviously, was because uh, Saddam Hussein, really, I mean, the main reason is because, number one, he was creating his own oil burst. And he was going to, because right now, if you don't know it, you got to own dollars to buy oil. You, you, know, you can't buy oil with any other currency. It is the dollar. It is a petrochemical dollar. That's what they call it, the petrochemical dollar. They don't call it the petrochemical franc. They don't call it the petrochemical euro. They don't call it the the petrochemical uh, yen. It's the dollar. Now, Iraq was creating its own verse, and that didn't work out. Iran's doing the same thing. So if you want to be able to purchase Iranian oil, you've got to buy into their verse, which means less dollars are being used. And you think that that's not significant. It's incredibly significant. Iran is probably number one or number three in terms of oil production in the Middle East. So that's another reason why the United States and its allies are really pounding, pounding the uh, the war drum pretty hard. But they also talked about Syria, and they they said that Assad also sponsors um, terrorism, and and you know they're. So here's what here's what happens is that we, we get these talking points, we get this dialogue, and it's un. What happens is is that it's unchallenged. It's unchallenged in that moment. You know, the moderator could not sit back and say to either Joe Biden or Paul Ryan, "Well, how can how do you give us some links? Give us give us some give us some credible information." about state-sponsored 
terrorism in Iran or Syria. Not only that, but the moderator can't say, well, doesn't Israel have nuclear weapons? Why, why can they have nuclear weapons? Or how, why can they have nuclear power and the, other, and the other governments in the region can't? Those questions never get asked. And so what we had last night was in some ways a legitimization of the whole notion that those areas, especially Iran and, and to a lesser extent, but not much lesser than Syria, are worthy of not only being sanctioned against, which they are, but also invaded. And they talked about a line in the sand, which is, I believe, in May, March or May. This is the red line that Netanyahu brought to the UN, which, of course, none of them debated, neither of them debated. So this is troubling because what's happening is through these debates, not only are do not only are the candidates, presumptive candidates, addressing issues that are illusory, but they are legitimizing the language and contextualizing the the paradigm that this is going to be or these are going to be theaters of conflagration that the United States will willingly enter into. And that to me is is disturbing. And the thing that I also found disturbing was that I'm going to call the left out. The right, look, we know the right. The right are are fucking warmongers, okay? They're warmongers. They love war. War is big business for the right. It has been for a very long time. And Paul Ryan made a a, a classic uh, case for that in terms of the, the military spending and this whole notion that, you know, we have to be mighty and feared abroad so that nobody can so that we're respected. But the people that were watching the debates last night, all they cared about, and this is Berkeley, it is a hotbed of liberal love. The what I saw was a group of people leaning into their screens, hoping, wishing, praying that Joe Biden would metaphorically knock the teeth out of Paul Ryan. And it became almost like an ideological witch hunt. Now, maybe if I was in, let's say, I don't know, Plano, Texas, it might have been different. It might have been, uh, in fact, I'm sure it would have been different. It, It would have been, hey, you know, go after that. East Coast smarmy liberal Joe Biden, Paul Ryan, go get him, be the bulldog. But what I don't think, the only time people had any real uh, any real traction or any real teeth that they put into this thing, except for a few smattering of applause for Biden when he mugged for the camera, which I'll talk about, uh, was when Paul Ryan talked about women's issues and abortion and forcible rape. And and all of a sudden, wow, boy, it really got hot in there. Very hot. Because most of the people that were watching debates in Berkeley at that time were women. So it was uh, was absolutely and utterly, utterly depressing. And Biden... You know, interestingly enough, referred to Mitt Romney as his friend on three different occasions. On the third occasion, he caught himself and didn't call him his friend anymore. Fact of the matter is, he is his friend. And this whole idea that Biden is down with the people and, you know, he's out there along with the rest of the Democratic Party protecting the interests of the middle class. It, to me, has got to be one of the biggest moments of hypocrisy I've ever seen. I mean, this guy, think about Joe Biden. Where was Joe Biden? Where's, you know, where was he a senator from? Delaware. Delaware. Does anybody even really live in Delaware? No. Do you know what is in Delaware? Corporations. If you want to incorporate... You have your zip code in Delaware. 
Joe Biden became the senator for corporations. Joe Biden was yammering on and on and on about these 180,000 families. I'll bet you if you did the math, he's one of those 180,000 families. The amount of hypocrisy. And Paul Ryan, Paul Ryan, he's probably one of the 180,000 families, but not as much as Biden, believe me. Biden's been in the game for a long, long time. He is pretty wealthy. And his mugging, and you know, and, and I said last night, I said, you know, I don't think they should have the split screen. Let's just give me the candidate. I don't want this to become, you know, kind of a class clown affair, even though it already is. You know, his smiles, his rolling of his eyes, his ho, 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 hands in the air. I mean, come on. Of course, you know, it's just, it's whatever. It's insulting is what it is. The whole thing was insulting. And to think that these people in Berkeley really thought that they would get some measure of gratitude that their candidate would knock the snot out of Paul Ryan and the Republicans and that their their version of America, which, by the way, is not a great version, would would carry the day. Because getting back to this whole notion of war, here they are, they're debating about Iran and Syria and all these places, legitimacy of conflict. And nobody ever, ever questions whether, especially on the left, whether we should even be there, drone technology. The left, as far as I'm concerned, are, I'm going to tell I'm going to say it right now, the left are chicken shits, all right? They're chicken shits. When it comes to facing the issue around war and conflict and drones and surveillance and the loss of personal freedoms and rights, they are in denial and they are chicken shits. And I I have no respect for them when it comes to those areas. I believe they're complete and utter sellouts because they're, they have they have their issues. Like you you ta- okay, try this. You take away abortion rights and birth control. You put that on the table to the left, and boy, do they get do they get up in arms. But you you talk about security and surveillance and the TSA. They it's like forget it. Doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother them. It doesn't bother the right either. Apparently. You know, they don't care. Take them away. Take away the rights because we'll be safer. We'll be more secure. You take away the rights tax cuts, it's the equivalent of abortion. It's a mess, folks. It's an absolute utter mess. And that dog and pony show that I saw last night, and I had to watch in front of my son, set a bad tone for the Oakland A's game. That's all I can say. Now, you could say I don't care about politics. And you, you, for, you couldn't be further from the truth. I do. I care about this country. I care about this planet. I'm not. I'm not a, a, a xenophobe. I love people from other cultures. I respect them. I don't always agree with some of the uh, tenets, but that's life. You know, it, it is what it is. But I respect the right for for all human life. And I think we're in a very challenging place. We're in a very challenging place. I was just looking at a headline from Leon Panetta, essentially saying we're days away, moments away, weeks away, who knows how long from some type of 9-11 event, pre-9-11 event, which has to do with the Internet and that Iran is going to be behind it and Iran is going to take down the Internet. That's what I'm seeing. I just saw it on Yahoo. So here we go. You know, there's a show out right now called Cybergeddon, which is essentially the meltdown of the entire Internet and and, and the infrastructure of the Internet. I should back up my website, huh? That's what I should do. So they're laying the tracks. 
they're laying the tracks for whatever that next thing is. And I gotta tell you, it doesn't matter whether Obama is in office or whether uh, whether Mitt Romney's in office, they are going to go after Iran. They are going to go after Syria. It is it is a, it is they, they have no other option because these are sovereign countries. They're sovereign countries with zero debt, and they cannot have them exist in the region like that. Everybody else is bought, sold, and paid for. Done. They don't have to worry about any of them. Saudi Arabia, don't have to worry about it. Jordan, don't have to worry. Well, I don't know. Jordan, maybe a little bit. Lebanon, maybe just a touch. Just a touch. But for the most part, they don't have to worry about them. Libya, they got Libya out of the way. Egypt's out of the way. You know, this is this is where, you know, Iran and Syria are the two big Gordian knots in the visions and plans of the new world order. Yep, that's right. And uh, they're not going away. It's going to get resolved on their terms. And people need to be prepared for that because no amount of protest is going to stop what these guys are planning on doing. The only thing that we can do right now is to have conscious awareness around it, to bring it out in the open, expose it, look at it, breathe it, exhale it, and see it for what it is. That's 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 where we are right now. And I and, and people say, well, what good does that do? It does a lot of good. Because what it does is with enough conscious awareness to certain potentialities and events, we can actually alter them to a degree. Because the thing about 9-11 that really, you know, unless you were incredibly oracular, and there's some people that were, but the thing about 9-11 that really was a game changer was that it took people by surprise. It blindsided us. And now, you know, there's a whole world out there that is constantly grinding and looking at events and symbols and energy and really doing their best to determine, you know, where things can go tilt next, whether it's real, whether it's targeted, whether it's flagged, who knows? People are crunching. They're crunching. They've been crunching for a while. You've got the sinkhole in Louisiana. It's getting bigger. It's getting much bigger. That's a problem keeping that on the down low. So anyway, I don't want to be a prophet of doom and gloom, but it's I, I can't I can't help but not share that. If I didn't, I would be remiss. I just brought in two wonderful musicians and artists because I also want people to know that these things that make us human, that bring us to levels of awareness and appreciation and sensitivity um, are out there. And they, and they are what makes the world gray, what makes the human experience a wonderful experience. So it's not without some attempt to lighten the load do I do this on a thrice weekly basis. And I hope you enjoyed them. I hope you enjoyed their music. I thought that they were terrific guests and really wonderful, wonderful music. And I'll put the links up on uh, the show page. And again, that was uh, Ross Daly and Kyla Flexer in the Labyrinth Project. So that's it, I think. I think we've come to the end of uh, today's labyrinthian journey from music to baseball. Actually, from baseball to music to world politics and all the way back to who we are and a sense of redemption. All right. Uh, It's going to be a tricky weekend, I think. It's my feeling. It's my sense. So anyway, hang on to yourself, as David Bowie once said, and uh, don't forget to buckle up when you drive or when somebody else's drive. Somebody somebody else drives. Uh, Use your head to discern what's real. Your heart to stay open to what's possible. I'm going to end on another piece of music. This is from, uh, let's see, what do we have here? This is from Kelly Toma. That's Ross. That's Ross. This is from Kelly Toma. This is Star Anis from Kelly Toma. You've been listening to the Friday Forecast. My guests 
were Ross Daly and Kyla Flexer of Labyrinth Project. And this is Ross's partner, Kelly Toma, with Star Anis. I will see you on Monday with the mashup. Have a great weekend. This is hold on, one, one is Nagma, Okay, this is yes, here we go. Let's try this again. Yes. Star Star Anis. Tell you tell See you Monday. Thank you.